Some 30 years ago, school S21 in Phnom Penh stopped giving lessons. Its classrooms became instead the scene of unimaginable horror. Some 15,000 people were tortured to death in these classrooms during the rule of the Khmer Rouge. But now, some of the people responsible may finally face justice. I'm Taymor Nabili, and on this edition of 101 East, we ask, is Cambodia's long national nightmare nearing an end? In just four brief, brutal years, some two million voices were silenced by the Khmer Rouge. And in the decades that followed, many more went unheard. But now, in the extraordinary chambers of the courts of Cambodia, the world is finally ready to listen to some of the stories of democratic Kampuchea. These are just a few of them. Based on their actions and on what they said, it looked to me like they wanted to murder everyone because they killed so many people. They killed people who made mistakes and those who hadn't. It was especially bad during the rainy season just before the rice harvest. They went around the houses counting off people to be executed. They said this house was all right, but those in that house had to be killed. My name is Paul Bhala. I was 25 years old at the time. I was a housewife. In 1975, I was a student at the Commerce Faculty in Phnom Penh. On the 18th of April that year, the Khmer Rouge arrived and removed us all from the city. Some people who did not obey the order were shot instantly right in front of Uma Laum Pagoda. I saw it with my own eyes. Two people on a motorbike came and the Khmer Rouge tried to stop them. They didn't stop and were shot. When I arrived at the Setha Bridge, I had a rest for about 24 hours. They allowed me to stop because I was having a miscarriage. Then, after a day and a night, they forced me to carry on walking. My name is Hong Hoi. I'm 52 years old and I'm a farmer. I guarded the outside of Tul Slang Jail, stationed at a street away from the actual prison. They ordered us to do their work. First, they ordered us to make dikes in rice fields and later to build a big dam. After a period of helping taking prisoners to the killing field, Dush asked someone to bring me and one of the executioners stationed there over to him. When only one prisoner remained alive, Dush asked me, are you committed? You are now about to become a real revolutionary, so you have to be loyal. I said, yes, I am committed. When I said this, Dush said, if you are so loyal, do you dare to kill? So I took an iron bar from someone and hit the prisoner's head. Then I dropped the iron bar and the other executioner put it in the grave. I only saw people tied up and taken away. I never saw with my own eyes people being killed, hit on the back of the head. I only saw bodies of those already dead with the back of their skulls broken, lying face down on the ground. Four, ten, twenty people, but I never saw them being hit with my own eyes. I didn't do anything wrong because I used to be a good man until they brought me to Tool Slang and said I had made mistakes. Nobody wants to do evil. Everyone wants to do good things. But they sent me there. If you ask anyone if they want to die, they'll say no. If the higher ranks ordered it, we had to obey them or die. Then they moved us to a new village called Solidarity. When they moved us there, they killed about 80% of the people in the old village. The trial? I don't know much about that, but it must bring justice because the dead people, those who lost family members and the poor survivors need to know why the deaths happened. I never dared hope I would survive. I never thought I could return home because I saw more death than life. For this edition of 101 East, we've brought together three guests with deep personal knowledge of the country. Professor David Chandler is one of the world's foremost scholars of modern Cambodian history, about which he's written numerous books, including a political biography of the Khmer Rouge leader, Pol Pot. 
Poi Kia is a Cambodian journalist, a survivor of the democratic Kampuchea regime. His father was one of the Khmer Rouge's victims. Separated from his family in 1975, he was forced to work in a children's camp until the Vietnamese troops entered Cambodia in 1979. And John Swain is an award-winning British journalist who spent five years in Cambodia and South Vietnam as a war correspondent. He was one of the few Westerners left in Phnom Penh when the victorious Khmer Rouge marched into the capital. His role was portrayed in the film The Killing Fields. Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Poikia, let me begin with you. We are, it seems, poised uh, at the start of what may be real action after 30 years in this Cambodian story. How will the people here react, do you think, when they begin to see action taking place? Well, the, uh, the majority of the Cambodian people are happy to see the process moving, moving on. And they wish that the, uh, the former Khmer Rouge leader uh, uh, will be punished. And uh, this is what they wish, and because the reason that they have suffered uh, for a long time ago, and uh, they want to see these uh, people responsible. Do they think this should have happened sooner? Uh, well, the, uh, they, they, they were very much uh, you know, frustrated uh, with this process uh, because it was a very uh, uh, long process and dragged on since 1997. We haven't actually seen the Cambodian population making much demand for this process. Uh, it depends on, on how access we are. Uh, uh, to what uh, extent uh, the, the, the point is that we did not have like, uh, a very open uh, a forum of, of public uh, opinion to uh, let them express uh, them themselves. Uh, it's very limited uh, so far. David, why is it that we are 30 years on and, and only now beginning to see this taking place? Well, it's a long story. I don't <coughs> go into all the details, but the first 10 years, of course, was uh, when Cambodia was isolated and the Western world was not pushing for these trials. Uh, last 10 years since there's been some pressure there's been all kinds of uh, difficulties on both sides of the bargaining table to how to how to form this uh, this tribunal how to put it together but in real terms there's an absence of political will surely i mean one one can talk about I well there was this and <coughs> there was that but well certainly you have you have to see, it certainly looks as if there's an absence of political will you can't document it because people don't come out and say we do not want this trial to take place but were it to were there more political will it would have been much quicker John, going back to what Pokia said, I mean, the, the, the absence of any real upswell of, of emotion within the country itself has, has been an interesting feature of, of what's been going on. Now, when you came back here in 1979, uh, when the Khmer Rouge were finally gone, what did you find? Did you, did you find a population that was hungry for some kind of accountability? I didn't, didn't find a population which was hungry for accountability. I found a population which was on its knees, which just wanted to survive. And it hadn't got beyond that stage. Um, I, it was the city which we're sitting in now is, was, was empty. Uh, there were still banknotes in the streets from, uh, from when the Khmer Rouge took over in 1975 and blew up the National Bank. And uh, nothing had been cleared. The city was, 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 was crumbling. It was devastated. And all the people who were living here, who had come back here in 1979, weren't even the population of the city because most of the population of the city. So, so pe people really looking just to get on with their lives more than anything else. They just wanted to eat and survive, basically, and uh, weren't, in the, weren't in the position of thinking of coming to terms with the past. Is, is that how it is now? I mean, are the Cambodians actually rather more interested in the issues of poverty and land uh, and oil than they are about this trial? Yeah, this is what I, I'm, I'm thinking of, and, and this is one of the, uh, one of the major problems uh, being faced by Cambodia today, that the, um, you know, the one particular person, one side, they want to have trial, uh, they focus on trial, but on the other hand, the, a lot more people, they think that oh, uh, trial is one thing, but the, the, the real problem is the, the poverty, about the corruption, the deforestation, um, deforestation lawlessness, and the uh, culture of, uh, of impunity, uh, other, other crimes or murders, not only committed in the past. The fact that we are sitting here in Tol Slang, one of the, probably the most notorious uh, example of exactly what happened during those years and it's now a tourist resort and uh, uh, seemingly fairly benign uh, and the Cambodians don't seem to mind that uh, people like us are overrunning their history in this way is this is this a surprise to you uh, no uh, it depends on on, on on people and depends on uh, whom you ask and and uh, to me I think um, again um, 
Well, the, the, we, we just want to have at least uh, this kind of uh, justice uh, bring about to Cambodian people. What do you think justice here will involve, John? I don't think there is justice. It's, I mean, which we, we in the West are trying to seek justice over, over evil, and um, it's already too late in this country. The, the main perpetrators of, this, of, this, of what happened here, of the Khmer Rouge sort of Holocaust, um, are, are the very old men and dead, and they've been, they're tilling their gardens up in Pailin and places, uh, the ones who will be finally brought to this court. Um, I, think, I think what happened in Cambodia was a situation where people were best, both perpetrators and victims of what the Khmer Rouge did. And this is a very murky sort of world where it's very difficult to have any real justice in, in international Western terms. Let's try and identify the scale of the crime then. I mean, we can't identify any real scale of justice, but the crime itself, David, I mean, describe the, the history of what it is we're looking at here. Well, <coughs> it looks as if the estimates now are that during the Khmer Rouge period, 75, 79, Somewhere between one and a half million and two million people died, what I call regime-related deaths. I mean, they would not have died if it were not for policies or behavior on the part of the regime. Of those, perhaps 300,000, 400,000 were executed as enemies of the state. In other words, they were murdered. Uh, 15,000 of them right here uh, in this, in Tul Slang S21, as it was called. Uh, it's a mass it's massive scale. I mean, per capita, this was a big, a big mess. That for this was a, uh, a those a fourth of the population disappeared in those four years. In a historical context, the mm. idea of a, a radical government taking over, eliminating its enemies, and trying to introduce a new government is not necessarily particularly new. But the Cambodia experience was a, a significant one relative to uh, what Mao was doing in China. Well, they just, they just went at it much, much faster and much harder and much more dogmatically than the, I mean, the Vietnamese, the Chinese, the land reforms, very costly in both those cases, but not costly to the same extent of this, of this uh, mistakes that they went after. They went after what they called mistakes and errors. And, uh, and they just went out with this dogged determination and uh, ended up with numbers that are very difficult to believe. If one thinks of Cambodia, as I often do, as a relatively peaceful place, like most countries, it's not a, not a more violent place than other countries. But the numbers are out at the month. It's so incredible. As John said, some of these people, uh, Nunchia <coughs> Pol Pot now is gone, but Nunchia is in Pailin tilling his garden. There are many uh, potential. Um, uh, uh, I guess uh, defendants in this trial who, are, who have houses I in Phnom Penh. Is this, is this not a, a source of, of hurt for Cambodians that they uh, are allowed to walk free in the streets right now? Yes, uh, well again the, the, the Cambodian people now you know rely more on the leaders. They, they, they have nothing to uh, deal directly by themselves but they rely on the, the leaders or whatever act uh, uh, to be uh, committed or to be acted by the leaders. So they just leave to the leaders. And, and again, um, yes, they, they have uh, uh, freedom. They can, they can walk, they can uh, 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 you know, move from one place to the other. For example, like uh, Mr. Kirsten Pond is now in Phnom Penh. He has a house here. Mm. And Mr. Ian Seri as well, uh, not very far from here. And he sometimes also travels to Bangka for medical treatment. Okay, let's take a, a brief pause if we can. We'll come back in just a couple minutes.